The mission of IEEE students is to deliver a common, high quality IEEE student membership experience globally for lifelong professional membership through IEEE. IEEE is a family. The friends you build through volunteering stay there. You really make friends for life. Getting involved at your local student branch, your local section, and your larger region is one of the many benefits that IEEE students have. You can also apply for a variety of awards, both as an individual and as an IEEE student member of your local branch. You can also get involved in a variety of contests and competitions, including our number one student competition, IEEE Extreme, a 24-hour global coding competition with over 8,000 students involved annually. IEEE Potentials is a premier student magazine. It provides you with the opportunity to get published and to review your peers' work as well. With over 400,000 members in the IEEE Global Network, you can get connected, find a mentor, and also collaborate with professionals in your field. If you want to do something to impact your community through IEEE, it gives you the resources. You can make the most of your IEEE membership by completing your profile. It allows us to contact you and keep you up to date with what's happening at the global IEEE offices. Take advantage of being an IEEE student member by collaborating on projects within your local student branch and your section with professional members. By collaborating on projects, you have the opportunity to get featured on IEEE TV. We'll see you there. Epics in IEEE empower students and local communities around the world to apply engineering to solve those challenges. The IEEE Event Finder allows you to locate conferences, meetings, events, and activities in your area and worldwide. You can get involved in a variety of special interest groups as well. Women in Engineering, Standards, and IEEE Young Professionals. YP represent. <laughs> of course, that's when you graduate. Remember, IEEE prides itself on being your professional home. Be sure to take advantage of everything the IEEE has to offer. The more you put in, the more you get out. We share the same fears, we share the same hopes, we share the same visions. And this is the best place we can exchange our experience and at the same time we can get support from our experienced colleagues at the same time. It's perfect. definitely changes your life. It helps you establish relationships that are really tighter because you already have a lot of things in common in the way you think, work, want to change the world around you. As, as you get involved in IEEE, you, you really get a sense that you want to give back and to grow the community that you have. I think there's a natural intersection between IEEE and its role in promoting the emergence of new technologies and entrepreneurship. IEEE was a great uh, channel to get to connect with professionals in the field. You never know what's going to happen when you meet so prominent people that are foreseeing the future. What has IEEE brought me? I've worked full-time in, in power system automation, which we call Smart Grid, for over 41 years now, full-time. And the job changes I've made were through industry friends that knew of opportunities that I wouldn't have known otherwise and opened up the door for me. And many of these industry friends I met through IEEE. What other place can you try to take a risk of doing our presentation skills and bringing in somebody from industry to talk to other scientists and engineers? I've been a member of IEEE for 25 years and I still talk and mentor about this to this day. IEEE has given me opportunities to network in terms of getting to know the leaders in the field and also has provided an outlet for those leaders to know what I'm doing. So uh, it's been um, uh, good for both of us. Given the world that we're living in now, where everything is pretty much about the internet and, and about connectivity, um, it's, it's actually a good time to be um, an engineer and to be a telecommunication and networking engineer. We know it's about the dynamics between people and people groups where our future is. And engineers can facilitate that, but they don't have the answers. It's the answering of us together as a community, not as engineers alone. So engineering is not going to solve the world, but it's going to facilitate. That, uh, that problem solving and getting together. At IEEE, we believe technologists are the key drivers of tomorrow's innovation. 
because we can really do what IEEE's motto states. We can advance technology for the benefit of humanity. I always wanted my education to mean something more than just, you know, um, doing a day job that pays my checks. I wanted to see how my background in engineering and other things could have an impact that can make somebody's life better. Being able to connect our members with younger students and engaging them to emphasize that it is important that what they are pursuing in their STEM careers is truly going to be the next thing that affects all of humanity because all technology that we make is affecting people and it's not just IEEE members, it's everybody. So hi everyone, um, thank you to be, for being here today uh, to see the talk of uh, the Professor Gerald Yu. So before, uh, I'm going to show you the next event of the IEEE student branch, uh, which I am the chair. So here you can see Sorry, there an, I was I had an, an issue with my uh, computer, so <laughs> the issue with the, the live. So uh, I share again my my screen. So here you can see the the event, the next event of November. So mm -hmm. next week we are going to uh, welcome uh, the Professor Ogozalek. Uh, on microelectronics going 3D, then Andre Vladimirescu on simulation and measurements in electronics. The next the two weeks after, uh, we are going to welcome Jean-Michel Redouté, uh, structured approach to EMI resistant IC design, and also Victor Grumblatt from Synopsis on soil mo moisture and soil temperature impact on crop growth, an IoT approach. So next, don't don't forget to come next week for the talk of uh, Professor Ogorzalek. Ajoutez une dimension à vos circuits. Uh, don't also forget the workshop of um, CAS Rio Grande do Sul. It's on uh, the beginning of November. Uh, also on November, you will have another workshop on how technology is, in, is impacting agribusiness. It's uh, organized by uh, Synopsis and especially uh, Victor Grimblatt. Uh, you will also have on November uh, the event uh, Act in Space, uh, which is going to take place in Bordeaux and uh, other town uh, in France. And in Bordeaux, it's going to be uh, virtual this year. So then also there, there will be uh, the conference uh, ICES, ICECS uh, 2020. It's going to be uh, normally uh, in uh, Scotland at the end of November. Uh, there is also the Nuit Européenne des Chercheurs. It's also all around France and uh, it's going to also to going to take place in Bordeaux. Uh, also, there is a call for papers for the ESCAS 2021. It's uh, in mid-November. And finally, there is also at the end of uh, 2000, uh, next year, there will be the IEEE Season School on circuit and systems for IoT. It will take place in uh, Bordeaux. So many thanks. Uh, I'm going to let uh, Antoine say a few words. Yes, I'm very happy to, to welcome today uh, you. So thank you for accepting to, to present your research for this uh, B talk, Bordeaux Electrical Engineering Student Branch. Um, I guess that's the fourth B talk, right? Um, yeah, so thank you, Gerald. So last time you were in France was about like one year ago, we were visiting ago, yes. uh, Lille for a workshop on uh, machine learning hardware. And so uh, today you're uh, virtual in Bordeaux. 
yeah and uh yeah physically in, in singapore <laughs> uh, hopefully yeah it will get better as time uh goes and uh we'll be able to uh to physically meet in the in the near future mm -hmm. yeah so last thing I uh, really want to acknowledge uh, Romaine Dumont and uh, her team for uh, for the very nice organization. Um, yeah, so keep on uh, continuing this this great uh, effort, and we'll try to help as uh, uh, as we can. Yeah. So thank you for animating the the community, and uh, thank you again, Gerald, and that's a pleasure to uh, thank you. host yeah. you and welcome you today. Yeah. So. Many thanks. So I'm going to say a few words um, about uh, Professor Yu. So Gerald Yu received the Bachelor, Master and uh, PhD degrees in the Department of Electrical Engineering from the Korea Advanced Institute of Science and Technology in 2002, 2007 and 2010, respectively. From 2010 to 2013, uh, 16, sorry, he was with the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science uh, Mazdar Institute uh, in Abu Dhabi, where he was an associate professor. Since 2017, he, was, he has been with the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, National University of Singapore in Singapore, where he is currently an associate professor. Uh, he has fi finally he has pioneered researches on low energy body area network (BAN) transceivers and wearable body sensor networks using the planar fashionable circuit board for a continuous health monitoring system. So many thanks for being here, and uh, all I can say now is the floor is yours. Okay, many thank things. you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for the nice introduction. So I will present my work. Okay. Uh, today I'm going to talk about the body area network and the subtitle is connecting things together around the human body and my emphasis will be on around the human body okay so that's that's where all fun things happen and I will discuss why it's important to cover this okay this is the outline the first I will start off the human body channel which I'll be using not the RF but the human body channel itself as a communication medium to form the body area network and I'll also tell you why that's important. And to start off with, you need to interface. If you want to communicate through the body channel, you need to interface with the human body. And that's what I'm going to talk about. Followed by the transceivers and the network and also the future direction, which I will hopefully uh, draw some of your interest there. Okay, so why do we need the body area network in the first place? Well, um, there are many reasons for that, but one of the reasons is because now the paradigm is shifting from reactive health management after the disease has happened to become a proactive healthcare. So now the goal here is that we need to intervene, you need to stop the deteriorating health from uh, getting any worse. And that requires the continuous healthcare during the everyday life. And as we already know, this is easier being said than done. And a lot of the reason, a lot of the reason also comes from the fact that collecting the data from the human body around the human body is not as e easy as we might think. Okay, so the requirement here, apart from the um, IT perspective, is that the comfort, comfortness, easy to use, and safe safety is a, is a primary importance, I would say. And that's where uh, the wearable healthcare with the body area network, I call body area network in abbreviation as a ban is a solution. Okay, so what's the definition of the body area network in the first place? Well, if you look at some communication using the RF, for example, uh, error coupled RF communications, we have some standards already, uh, widely used standards include the wireless LAN, which uh, is supposedly cover around hundreds of meters, but we all know that the actual coverage is much less than that. And uh, there is also wireless PAN standards such as the Zigbee and Bluetooth, which we are widely using these days, which is supposedly covering up to around five to 10 meters. And that's all fall into IEEE 802.15, uh, the standards. And the body area network, there's a standard with the 15.6, where the coverage is typically less than two meters. And this is because uh, most of the human beings have a height of less than two meters. So the target here is to cover the body area only. 
And that's that has two two sides. One that the coverage is only up to two meters means that in the in terms of security, it'll be better if you compare with the Bluetooth and Zigbee because it's difficult. It'll be difficult to eavesdrop whatever is communicating. For example, the body one sensors that then you have let's say the smartphone collecting the data. You want to make sure that no one hears eavesdrop this data then and capture it and hacks into it. And there is still an unmet territory when it comes to data rate and the power consumption. So if you look at this chart, when you talk about the Bluetooth low energy, that typically consumes around uh, five to 10 milliwatts, and the data rate goes up to around megabits per second, which is low power in terms of RF, RF transceivers. So for example, if you compare with the Wi-Fi, definitely the Bluetooth is low power. But if you look at the body area network for the healthcare and also for multimedia applications, the data rate requirement is typically below one megabit per second, but the power requirement is really stringent. You need to make sure the power consumption is no more than one milliwatt because you want to uh, not drain the battery too soon. And in that term, you can see that this, this territory is still unmet. And we have a lot of researchers working on here, and that's why we can uh, improve and also uh, satisfy the territory that is unmet at the moment. And uh, here, this chart, I would like to also emphasize a lot. Uh, we as uh, electrical engineers, especially circuit designers, typically focus on the physical layer energy efficiency, which, the, uh, which is responsible for the uh, bit transmission. And continuous monitoring requires energy efficiency. And we think by having lower joule per bit, in the file layer, that will translate to longer battery life. And what I'd like to say here is that is only partially true. So you also need to think about the application network and data link layer. And what I mean by that, so for example, if you have a mixture of two types of sensors, one is glucose sensor that only requires uh, monitoring around five times a day, maximum 10 times a day. And then you also have an ECG sensor, which needs to access the channel all the time. And if you use, for example, contention-based access, MAC layer, that means before you transmit the data, you are sensing if the channel is occupied or not. And that sensing actually takes up energy. And because of this 10 times a day glucose sensor, the ECG sensor, which will be transmitting tons of data, always before sending the data has to sense whether the channel is occupied or not. So that's not efficient. And that's what I mean by having data link layer consideration for the network wise. And that includes the multiple access and network control. And not to mention the network layer where you need to have an always reliable connection. So when it comes to healthcare in particular, you don't want to lose any data, for example. You don't want to lose the important traits in your heart rhythm, for example. Uh, and that's very really where the reliability of the network becomes an issue. And also, in order for uh, to achieve the continuous health monitoring, convenience factor is really, really important. I would like to really emphasize this 100 times. Even if you have a nice technology, if the user doesn't use it, then that's the end of it. So you really want to make sure it's really easy to use. All right. And uh, what I mean by having diverse health sensor types especially when it comes to the Mac layer access, is an example is shown in the slide. So if I categorize the healthcare sensor types, one will be the continuous reading and recording sensors, such as ECG or EG and EMG and et cetera. So this requires lower energy operation, needs single to multi-channel, and you really need to access the channel all the time. And there are second type of sensors, spontaneous sensors, such as glucose, blood pressure, body temperature, and et cetera. And these one, you don't actually need to sense 24 seven. Uh, you read, I mean, uh, rather you just need to access maybe 10 times a day. And there's third type, which is the stimulating sensors, such as electroacupunctures and in impedance cardiography and et cetera. Here, you also need to have high current drivability. Okay. So if, let's say, what's the big deal about the body or network? Can't we just use uh, Bluetooth low energy to form it or Zigbee for low power consumption? The answer is yes, for uh, some applications, yes, that's a perfectly fine solution. 
So for example, it's very convenient. You don't need to do any calibration, etc. It's very intuitive and flexible number of nodes. Uh, for example, Zigbee allows you to connect up to 255 sensors. And in the body area, you're not going to connect more than tens of sensors. So that's a practically flexible number of nodes that is allowed. And because you're using battery, you really have an available power source. But on the other hand, there's potential interference coming in, which I'll be talking in the coming slides. Also, it's difficult to form multi-channel. Okay, so that is another research going to uh, forming a multi-channel with the wireless sensor node, but that's uh, out of the scope of today's talk. And uh, hence, this is more suitable for short-term monitoring. Instead of seven days or two days of monitoring, it's more suitable for short-term monitoring. For especially for body temperatures, blood pressures, and so etc. That would be perfect sense. Okay, but we also need to think about the following. When it comes to RF-based radio for body area network, there is a clear limitation. So for example, uh, many of these standards are using 2.4 gigahertz, if not gigahertz range. And that range is unfortunately prone to uh, many frequency eaters. And we need to understand the fact that human body is really absorbing a lot of energy, especially from one gigahertz to around 10 gigahertz. And unfortunately, that's the standard uh, most of the RF radios are using those center frequency. So if you have a line of sight, when I say line of sight, you have your smartphone and you have a sensor in your wrist and you can, and the smartphone can see the wrist, then there's a line of sight, then this RF is perfectly working fine. But let's say your smartphone is in your back pocket and you are transmitting from your ECG sensor on your chest. Then there's no line of sight. If you're inside, indoors, because of the reflection, the communication will happen. But if you go outdoors, the RF radio power, transmitting power is not sufficient to penetrate through the body. So you're doomed. So, so we, in that sense, we need to have some complements. Okay. So as I said, limitations of the RF radio is uh, with the serious body shadowing effect, which is really difficult. And on top of that, for example, AirPods, you can see that uh, some of you might be thinking, why do we need to have that small antenna, a small stick sticking out of the AirPod? And the part of the reason is because otherwise, if the antenna is embedded in your earlobe, then it's very difficult to communicate through the body. And that drains the battery really, really soon. So if you're talking about some applications, especially around the human head, like by your hearing aid, this is the worst possible scenario for the RF radio. You really have to deal with the 60 plus dB of additional attenuation. OK, uh, this is the radiation pattern in the vicinity of the human body. I didn't talk about the antenna in the vicinity of the human body, but the message I wanted to give you here is that antenna don't go along with the human body attached that well. So it, it actually gives an additional uh, path loss, which is not good. So if that's the case, is there any complement to the human body, uh, I mean, body area network? Well, I'll say there are three types of body corporal communication that can complement the RF on the body area. And when we say body couple, it means that instead of the let the human body work as a blockage, you can actually Used, used the human body self as a coupling medium. So now that's uh, flipping the table. And the first type of that body couple communication, in short, BCC, will be the magnetic coupling. So here you're utilizing the magnetic flux to communicate between TX and RX, and it, it's a very uh, efficient way of communicating. Second is the galvanic coupling, which uses the galvanic current from the transmitter to the receiver. So you have two electrodes on the TX and two electrodes on the RX side. And the third type is the capacitive coupling, where you have the one electrode on the TX and one electrode on the RX, and you're relying on the electrical field to communicate. So each one of these have pros and cons, which I'll be discussing in, in the coming slides. Now, when it comes to the capacitive coupling, the good news is that you can have whole body, in entire body coverage because of the less path loss compared to the galvanic coupling, but at the cost of much more sensitive, sensitive to the environment. This means that depending on your posture, this may change, the path loss may change. And this is uh, most of the reason comes from the fact that the return path is formed by the parasitic ground 
of the transmitter to the Earth ground, as well as the RX, trans, uh, RX ground to the Earth ground. So if you're sitting posture versus the standing, the path loads will change. Okay, so let's first look at the magnetic BCC. As I said, we are utilizing, the magnetic BCC utilizes the magnetic resonance through the body one coils. It's really robust to the environmental changes. So, so for example, unlike the capacitive coupling BCC, uh, you don't need to worry about the environmental change that much. And it's suitable for wearables on the limbs and ears. And that's because of the form factor, you have to have the coil around your, let's say, wrist or the earlobes and so forth to insert the, um, the magnetic flux. And that's actually pros and cons. So the cons is that the form factor is somewhat limited. So if you want to communicate between the chest to, let's say, the back pocket, it's difficult to place the coil around the chest. So that's why uh, the cons is there. But at the cost of that, the form factor limitation, uh, it's fairly robust, and I think it's a good way to communicate if your sensor is uh, like a smartwatch that I'm wearing right now. Okay, second type of BCC is the galvanic BCC. Now you have two electrodes, one pair of electrodes on the transmitter and then one pair of electrodes on the receiver. And the galvanic current is flowing through the TX to the body, uh, TX through the body to the RX. And here it's really robust to the environmental and the subject dependency. It, it, it's subject independent. It's really robust to the environmental changes and it's suitable for relatively short distance. And the, the reason I'm saying short distance is because the path loss compared with the capacitive or the magnetic BCC is much higher. But at the cost of much higher um, capacity, much higher path loss, you can see this group um, have achieved BR performance of around 100 times better BR um, performance compared to capacitive BCC. And uh, the energy efficiency at 100 megabit per second is much higher, much, much better compared to the capacitive BCC. But the pitfall here is that the communication distance is typically limited to less than 30 centimeters. So uh, for bionic arm that this group was targeting, it's fine because you're communicating from the bionic arm to the uh, skin right underneath it. So that's, that's fine for this application. But if you want to cover the entire area, body area, probably you need to also think about the capacitive BCC. Okay, so when you say the capacitive BCC, you are utilizing human body itself as a communication medium, just like the, the previous two approaches. But the difference here is that you now only have one electrode in the RX, TX as well as the RX. And then if you compare the RF on body, not the RF on the, uh, the air coupling, I mean air channel, I'm talking about the RF around the body. As I said, there will be additional path loss. If you compare with that, you can see that the path loss is much less. Uh, minimum 20 dB less, up to around 40 to 50 dB less path loss. Less path loss means uh, you can shoot the power at much uh, less power at the TX, which means that you will have the energy efficiency. And also, another good news is that you don't need to have an antenna. For the RF, you need to have an antenna. And for magnetic coupling, you need to have a coil. But here, you can use the electrode. And you can e actually use these, the same electrode you're monitoring with EKG. You can use that for the transmission as well. So that's good news. But the bad news is that the channel variation with respect to the skin contact or the postures or environment is, is very serious. So that's where the circuit designers has to do the diligence. OK, with that, I split today's talk into four. The first is the body channel the path loss characteristics and measurements and modeling. The second is the interface. Because of the skin electrode impedance variation, you need to adapt to it. Otherwise, the, the communication quality will be really bad. And the third is about the transceiver. So I said in the capacitive BCC in particular, um, it's really prone to the um, environmental and changes as well as the posture. So the transceiver has to overcome that difference and that variation. And lastly, I'll talk about the network. You need to, you, once you have the transceiver, transceiver that achieves one-to-one -one or one-to-end communication, you also need to have a network layer, as I mentioned in the previous slides, that will lead to ultimately system level energy efficiency. Okay, so let's first look at the body channel. 
Uh, since the capacitive BCC is relatively new field, we uh, first started, this is already some time ago, I, I started this research in 2005. Uh, we first had to start off with measuring the human body path loss I mean, in regards to the uh, body channel communication with the one electrode in the TX and one electrode in the RX. And you might also ask, what's the big deal there? Just use the RF generator in the one side, have the spectrum analyzer in the other side and, and measure it. Isn't it just as simple as that? Well, the answer is no, it's not actually that simple because if you just connect the RF generator in the TX and then the RX in the spectrum analyzer, remember these are plugged, power plugged to the earth ground strongly. And then if you just use it to measure the path loss, the return path will be firmly connected, wire connected to earth ground. So this means the path loss will be much less compared to, to, to the wearable condition where the body area network will be. So this means that you need to actually isolate the measurement equipment's ground to the earth ground. And if you plug into the power, wall-mounted power, that immediately you plug in, it'll be connected to the earth ground. So that, that's why you need to think, think carefully how to separate the earth ground. And one way of doing it is to use the battery operated RF generators and a battery operated spectrum analyzer. And there are some groups doing it that way as well. And that's very effective. Or the second option is you can use the balloon. Balloon is a balanced unbalanced port with the uh, separation of the earth ground to the TX ground. So if you look carefully into this sign, this sign, the balloon ground is, is floating and the other side is connected to the earth ground through this equipment. So by inserting the balloon in between, you can actually separate the earth ground between the equipment and the earth ground. And this is the result. We measured it, we swept the frequency from uh, 10 megahertz to around 150 megahertz. And we found the path body channel actually exhibits or the band pass characteristic, especially around 30 or 40 megahertz up to around 80 to 100 megahertz, all right? And the maximum channel gain happens around 70 to 80 megahertz, which uh, let's not haste it. We, we might think this is the best frequency to use, but it's not always like that. Okay, let me go to uh, this example. When we measure with a different subject, we find that each subject has, a, has his or her own unique characteristic in terms of the path loss. So it is true that from 60 to 80 megahertz in general, the path loss is, is less. But if you look at this particular subject, it's not the case. In this particular subject, you, do, you want to avoid using 65 megahertz because the path loss is much higher, right? So this means that we have to also adapt to this path loss difference between the subjects, all right? This may give you up to around 20 dB of path loss, all right? So just to summarize the channel side, the BCC shows strength over the RF for an on-body network. I'm, I'm emphasizing on the on-body. And capacitive coupling BCC was chosen because the path loss is minimized for about 40 to 100 megahertz bandwidth. And the BCC coverage is within between the torso and the target is entire body. But the capacitive BCC must deal with the non-ideality, including the varying ground effect or the posture effect, environmental change, and also interference issues. Okay. Okay, now we are going to shift the gear a little bit to the interface. Okay, now we study the body channel. Let's look at the interface. I said in the capacitive BCC, you need to have one electrode touching the body in the TX and another electrode touching the body in the RX. Okay, that means there's a skin to electrode interface. And unfortunately, in the, this is a common problem to all the wearables. When it comes to skin to electrode in, um, interface, as you move around, the skin to electrode interface changes. And that we sometimes call it baseline wonder, sometimes we call it the motion artifact. And most of the problem comes from the varying skin to electrode impedance. So, in order to counteract that impedance variation, we need to measure the skin to electrode impedance. And one way of doing it is to generate a pure sine wave. Okay, in, in, in the frequency domain, that will be reflected as an impulse, um, in the impulse response in single tone. And then you measure the voltage 
across the Rx side. And that impedance variation will be reflected as the voltage difference in the Rx. And that's how you can measure the impedance accurately. But in the wearables, this is possible for, I mean, good, good solution for general cases. But in the wearables where the power consumption is a big problem, generating this pure sine wave is not easy. It's at, at the cost of large power consumption. So what we thought is, can we actually utilize the pulse they were communicating with? And at the same time, use that for impedance monitoring. And that's also possible because depending on the skin to electrode variation, impedance variation, the capacitance of the interface change will be reflected as the RC time constant. And that means if you have a larger capacitance, larger capacitance happens when the electrode is detached further. I mean, a larger capacitance happens when it's attached firmly to the skin. So the top and the bottom plate formed by the electrode and the skin is less, then the capacitance gets larger. But once the electrode gets detached, the capacitance decreases, and that's actually reflected in the RC time constant. So if you can measure that RC time constant time from the pulse you're transmitting, then you can theoretically detect the real part of the impedance change. It's actually not the impedance, it's the real part of the impedance. But that is sufficient to adapt in the low power applications. And by doing that, you can actually consume around, uh, I mean, save around 80% power compared to the sine wave generation and monitoring side. Okay, this is the measurement. Uh, we simulated this electrode variation, impedance variation, by suspending the electrode from one millimeter to up to around five millimeters. And you can see that actually the RC time constant difference is visible. Okay, so moving on, now we are going to look at the third part, which is the transceiver. Okay, we have seen that the skin electrode variation is there, channel variation depending on the posture and the person-to-person -person variation is there. Now it's transceiver's job to overcome such variations. Okay, we talked about the varying contact impedance variations. And on top of that, we also have the in-band interference problem. Okay, what I mean by in-band interference is as following. I remember, I still remember this day. Let me share one, uh, one, Thing that happened. So in when we first announced this technology in 2007, we 2006, we had this nice transceiver demo setup. So we presented this demo setup. It was a music player. So on the one side, you have the music uh, MP3 player. When you touch the one side and TX, and the other side, we had a speaker. So when you touch the speaker and the music player, it transmits through the body and the music can be heard through the speaker. So that was a really neat uh, PCC demo, but it was working really fine in the lab. But when we presented in the conference, it didn't work. Okay, and later we found the reason was because of the strong in-band interference from the security guards walkie-talkie, which unfortunately uh, fall into the same loop, same uh, bandwidth as the um, PCC transceiver we were using. So. In order to overcome such problems, if you have a known priori interference, you can probably use frequency hopping, but in adaptive way. This is well-known uh, technology used in the RF. But that if you have a frequency hopping, you typically hop away between bands. But if you have a really strong interference coming in in priori, you just skip that part and use the other um, bands. That's really, I mean, it's very clear, but and a very easy way to straightforward way to do it. But in order to achieve it with the low power consumption of TX side, uh, there needs some technology, I mean, some techniques to overcome the low power consumption overhead. Now, one of such way is to use direct switching FSK modulators for the frequency hopping. This means that you now have two separate frequency synthesizers instead of one. Because if you use one frequency synthesizer in PLL and then you lock in from one frequency band to the other, the locking in time and then the uh, stabilization time actually consumes a lot of power in the PLL. But instead you have a fixed frequency synthesizers and then sweep, swap between those two, you can actually reduce the power consumption a lot. So we can see that the hopping time is reduced by one fourth and the spur reduction of around 20 dB is uh, achieved. And the power consumption for this transceiver was around two milliwatt. Okay, and the other way of overcoming that in-band interference will be 
the broadband human body, I mean, a uh, mixture of the broadband and the time domain interference rejection. So what uh, the frequency hopping will be in the narrow band transceiver. So you have to hop away and avoid this uh, in-band interference. And the broadband communication will be, you have the frequency communication and then you have interference coming in in between. Then you have to uh, overcome this interference. That's not easy. Now, uh, this group, uh, has introduced one way to overcome such issues called a broadband human body communication with the time domain interference rejection. The idea is as follows. You are using the broad broadband TX, which if you just use it without any interference rejection, you will be uh, over, you will be having issue with the in-band interference. But if you can sample it multiple times and make sure that the interference comes outside the broadband interference. And you also have this frequency response of the integration of the uh, periodic signal. The TX, the data itself, which is constant amplitude, adds up as you integrate. But the interference, which is periodic time varying, remains periodic sinusoid, which means it will be reflected as a single tone. All right. So if you just add them up, the TX side can be added up, whereas the interference is in the single tone you can actually reject this interference, which is uh, periodic sh periodically showing, and the integrated data in the transceiver will be intact. All right, this is a neat idea to overcome such interferences. But that's for the in-band interference rejection. We still have to deal with the varying environmental and return path, especially when it comes to capacitive BCC. And that, uh, we also have other ways of doing it, such as the automatic gain compensation. This means that if you sense more path losses coming up, then you adapt to that more path loss by increasing the TX power. And also the se uh, second type is the hybrid OFDM. I also discussed in the coming slides. Okay, so automatic loss compensation, the concept is as follows. You have the LC tank, LC tank, your inductors, and then the capacitive in the path, uh, path loss. So they will form an LC tank. And you are going to adjust the amount of inductors switching on the series inductance to control the center frequency in the resonance. Okay, and that the key concept here is that you are adjusting the uh, TX inductor to compensate the the LC tank. So this diagram on the TX is control signal for the inductance. So for example, if you have larger IL number here, that means you're turning on more inductors. So you first Perturb, this is called the perturbing the induct inductance to make sure that the, you're sensing the uh, variation in the channel. So you first perturb the uh, inductance value and then see if that actually results in less or more pa path loss and you sense it in the Rx and then you will be updating the inductance value accordingly. So it's very simple concept, but you're perturbing, meaning that you're changing the center frequency in the Tx and to see if there's any additional path loss happening or more or less path loss happening. And depending on the result in the Rx, you're going to update the L bank. That's really simple, but powerful method. Okay. And you may also ask me questions. Um, we have a nice uh, modulation technique called OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing, which is widely used for the unknown or fading channels, okay? So unlike the frequency hopping where you have to worry about uh, where the interference is coming and so forth, the OFDM actually uses multi-carriers and you don't care about the interference coming in, you just uh, use multiple channels and multiple frequencies and multiple phases to recover, uh, aggregated recoverage at the RX. And this overcomes the signal multipath and it's really robust against the channel impairments. So it, it becomes really natural thought that, oh, why don't we just use the OFDM for the body couple communication in capacity coupling? Okay, the problem, only problem I'll say is that this is a nice way and actually an excellent way to overcome the problem of uh, varying channel path loss as well as the environmental changes. But the problem again, when it comes to body area network is the power consumption. Okay, you have extremely low uh, power requirement. As I said in the previous slide, the target is to have around one milliwatt or less. And with the OFDM, that's not easy. And particularly, there's one issue with the peak to average power ratio. So because you're using multi-carrier as well as multi-frequency with the different power, 
is sometimes you are shooting at very high frequency, I mean high, high power, and sometimes the average power will be very less. And the power amplifier and the DAC has to have guaranteed the linearity for the wide range of power. And that's not easy. Okay, so that's what I said as a peak power to average power ratio problem. And I, I, actually, it's not a problem, it's a trade off. If you can burn more power, you can overcome that issue to have a wider dynamic range of the power amplifier as well as the DAC. But the problem in the particular example we are talking about in the wide area network is that you don't have such power uh, available. available. So the PAPR problem in the typical OFDM is that several uh, people have been, many research has been done in this field, uh, such as clipping and filtering, meaning that instead of using the shooting the maximum power, you use the field clipping, selective mapping, block coding, and as, et cetera. But uh, there are also some limitations related to PAPR, in particular in the uh, presence of the low power consumption requirement. And that's why we came up with some ideas here. Can we actually remove the TX, um, and the DAC, and the PA completely and just transmit it through the uh, conventional FSK or uh, conventional modulation techniques? You just utilized the OFTM baseband. So you'll, you'll be expanding the frequency um, and, and then you're going to transmit that data to typical FSK modulation, for example. And since you're removing the power amplifier and the DAC, you are free from the PAPR. And uh, compared with the conventional FDM, there will be around 60% area reduction. And you are still mitigating the ground effect and signal multipath. We proved that by the measurement. But biggest problem is, if you, of course, if you gain something, you always lose something. In this case, what you lose is the bandwidth. And if you talk to the typical um, RF people, Larger bandwidth, occupying larger bandwidth is a crazy idea. You cannot do that because in the RF communication, every hertz is dollar. Whereas in the human body communication, in the body couple communication, your communication is constrained to the body area. And in that body area, you have relatively larger bandwidth to utilize. So that bandwidth is dollar isn't, isn't the case in the body area. That's why only in the body area network, you can trade off with the bandwidth. Yeah, that's what we're using here. So as I said, we, we name it as pseudo OFDM or the hybrid OFDM, because I would like to emphasize, we are not using the orthogonality of the OFDM anymore, but you are still using the baseband OFDM coding, block coding, and then you're going to transmit it through the uh, typical conventional FSK modulation. Okay, and let's see what the, uh, Okay, this is the summary of the comparison between the uh, conventional OFDM versus the hybrid OFDM. You are trading off the larger bandwidth to achieve uh, free from the PAPR problem and low power and area, okay? While still mitigating the, um, the problem with the channel path loss changes. Okay, I'll, I'll skip this slide. The hybrid OFDM performance, you can see when compared with the typical um, only FSK or the uh, with the only OFDM case you will see is that you are actually improving the BR performance significantly. So by utilizing larger bandwidth and then transmit through the conventional FSK, when compared with the FSK only, you are actually really compare uh, getting a larger, I mean, much better BR performance. Okay, so that's why you can also utilize, uh, I mean, at the presence of the channel variation, this performs much better. Okay, and of course, one of the issue will be how do you actually generate this baseband coding in the uh, hybrid OFDM? And we have utilized the fact that you can uh, remove the floating point multipliers by utilizing the fact that you already know the, the coefficients in the multiplier. So we'll be also using that in the um, 8, point OF, 8 point FFT and IFFT, but here we are using the 64.0 FFT and inverse FFT. So by if you are using the uh, generating multipliers, you don't, you cannot use this technique. But in this case, in the hybrid OFTM, the coefficients are already known priori, so you can actually decompose it into uh, two to the power of n. Okay, so then you can use the more um, instead of using multiplier, you can just use binary adding and shifting. 
That's why you can save a lot of area. And if you compare with some other techniques, uh, other RF transceivers, you can see that this is using the hybrid OFDM. It mitigates the multipath and it saves around 1.5 milliwatt of power consumption, which I would say is reasonably good. And an energy per bit is also good. The data rate is around one megabit per second. Okay, and one thing I, we noticed is that uh, if you use different QAM, for example, 64 point, 64 point QAM or eight point PSK, two point PSK, actually does, doesn't change that much in terms of uh, the, the performance. Actually the uh, binary PSK performs the best if we found in the body area. And if you look at the point, how many points in the, um, the block coding we're using, Comparing the 64 point versus eight point, we found that the uh, there's not much difference in, in the performance of the hybrid OFDM. Whereas if you have a smaller number of N in the points, the block coding, it obviously has a simpler design, but that becomes at the cost of lower data rate and higher clock, okay? But just as we did with the hybrid OFDM, if these two uh, downside, the low data rate is a higher clock, is still within our requirement, then we can perhaps trade off. And that's exactly what's happening here. So this time, the version two that we have implemented is using the scalable transceiver using around up to two megabits per second. And we are utilizing eight point FFT instead of 64 point. And that by doing that, you are considerably consuming less power consumption, okay? So uh, we still utilize the fact that instead of using generic multipliers, we utilize the fact that the, the uh, coding coefficient is known in priori. So you decompose it into two to the power of n. And that means binary shifting and subtraction addition is possible instead of the multiplier. And that saves a lot of area, okay? And if you compare with the 64 point FFT and a hybrid OFDM, you can see that the power consumption is significantly reduced. Logic gates, the area is uh, significantly reduced at the cost of higher clock. But if we compare the overall power consumption at the cost of higher clock, you still save significantly a lot of power because of the uh, power consumption mostly reduced by the uh, much simpler coding and the uh, gate count. And the BR performance, when you turn on and off the hybrid OFTM, you can see that improves a lot. Okay, up to around 70% improvement. And that, what's the implication of that in the body area network? We found that this translates to up to around 120 centimeters of the communication distance, All right? That's, that's much better improvement. Okay, so if you look at the result, we now have achieved a data rate of around two megabits per second, and the RX power is now dominating up to around one milliwatt, which is still good. And remember our target was to bring it down to around milliwatt range compared to the Bluetooth. And milliwatt is much better um, range that we are targeting for. And the data rate was below one megahertz, one megabit per second. So you can see that both requirement is now met. Okay. So now let me summarize the transceiver part. So in the transceiver side, in the, especially in the capacity BCC, you should tackle some practical challenges such as the varying contact impedance, which can be mon uh, monitored in real time. And in-band interference can be overcome such as the, uh, by techniques such as the adaptive frequency hopping. And varying environmental and return path can be overcome by some techniques such as the hybrid OFDM. And when I say hybrid OFDM, it combines the OFDM baseband with the adaptive frequency hopping file layer, which mitigates the signal fading ground effect and effectively brings down the uh, energy per bit as well as mitigating the ground effect. Okay, that brings us to the last part of today's talk, which is the formation of the network. Okay, so let me first briefly talk about topologies. So uh, if you talk to the generic RF transceiver and uh, generic uh, wireless network people, people will say that the ad hoc network will be much more energy efficient because if you have double the communication distance, the power requirement of TX will be quadruple. It's not in the linear relation, it's actually in the quadruple relation. So that's why if you can shorten the communication distance by this uh, ad hoc network, it will be more power efficient than the TX. 
But is that true in the body area network? Okay, so we have, uh, I have uh, done some simple simulation compared with the simple star network. These each bar, blue ball here is representing the sensor node such as EKG or the uh, temperature sensor. And do we need to have a router in between? Okay, remember this, this communication distance of body and network is typically less than two meters. And we use the network simulator tool called the GlomoSim. And here's the uh, simulation environment that I've used. The receiver threshold is around minus 70 dBm. And I use the continuous bit stream data of uh, every 0.4 second to 0.1 second. And you can see I, I've simulated around 16 min minutes. And you can see this energy, system energy, which will be provided by the battery or the power transfer is aggregated in all the number of sensor nodes. And you can see that the ad hoc network actually consumes more power. And this is because in the body area network, because of the small distance in the transmit, only up to around two meters coverage, it's not the TX power, but it's actually the RX power that dominates. And if you look at this network, the ad hoc, you will have, because of the routing, net, routing nodes, you have more sensor nodes, okay? So that's why the ad hoc network actually consumes more energy as a, aggregated as a system, okay? And also on top of that, we have to think about various vital signals. I, at the beginning of today's talk, I already briefly mentioned this, but for example, let's compare the temperature of the body, which is typically no more than 80 bits per second. But if you compare with the uh, EEG signal, which is around 4K bits per second, or EMG, which is 600 kilobits per second, you can see there's a vast difference, all right? And this means the packet size also has to consider the vast difference. The payload, can you use the fixed payload size? That means each time, if you have a too small payload size, you have to split up the data to many packets, and that becomes an overhead because of the presence of the headers and footers. But if you have a too long payload, that means one packet will be occupying the channel for a long time. And if you have mixture of Mac layer, if you have mixture of other uh, sensors tra trying to transmit the data, you also have a collision. All right, so that's why you have to think about how to design the packet carefully. And here we found that the variable pa size payload is working the best a payload size of around 70, 68 bits to around 4K bits. And why is it 4K bits? Because I also simulated using the same uh, global sim network simulator. And we found that if once the packet size passed around 4K bits, you can see that the energy reduction is not that significant. So that's why we chose around 4K as the packet size that you can use for body area network, All right? And I'm talking about the healthcare data as a data to be used in the payload. Okay, that actually concludes the technical side of the body area network for the communication. But before I finish, I would like to discuss five more minutes about the future directions in the body area network. And I would like to talk about the powering, not only on the communication, but also about the powering. Okay, so let me ask you this question. Um, how many wearables do you have, are you carrying these days, such as the smartwatch I'm wearing here or the AirPods? And uh, I have done some survey and most of, pe most of the people have less than three wearables. And uh, let, that's part, part of the reason is because let's say if you have tens of wearables, charging overhead becomes an extreme overhead. And I don't want to charge up 10 different devices every night. Right. So, for example, let's say you have the ECG sensor on the chest and you have the band aid that monitors your temperature and you have to charge that. And imagine you have a smartwatch and you have also the AirPod as well as your smartphone. OK, then you have five to six wearables that you have to charge up. Oh, I don't want to do that. So then naturally what we can think of is can we deliver the power? Of course, you can do that and delivering the power. Uh, easiest way for the wearables is used to RF power delivery. But what did I say about the power in the RF? I mean, the uh, RF communication. That is that it's limited by the human body blockage. And the same problem as in the communication happens in the power delivery. So if you look at the power delivery, let's say you have the TX and the line of sight is met. So TX is here and you have line of sight to the RX. You can see that in free space, 
not considering the antenna overhead. Antenna, as I said, in the vicinity of the human body or degrading performance. But if you exclude that effect, you can see that the communication distance can go up to around two meters in the presence of line of sight. Okay, because of the antenna inefficiency in the vicinity of the human body, if you have 2.4 gig with the line of sight with the vicinity of the body, still you can deliver power relatively well if you have line of sight. But if you do not have line of sight, such as your transmitter, a power transmitter is in your chest or your belly, and your receiver is in the back pocket, then because of the same problem in the communication, I said the body will be absorbing a majority of energy, and that gives additional 30 dB of path loss. And re recovering power with that such hard path loss will be extremely difficult and it's inefficient. And you can think of other technologies such as photovoltaics, but you know that if your band-aid is inside the body, I mean, under the underwear, then the PV is not the solution. Thermoelectrics can be covered, uh, covering the entire body, but you have to make sure there's a difference between one side in the temperature difference between the other gradient, which is not always guaranteed. And pH electric or tribal electric is another nice way to do that, but the maximum power can be only obtained in the joint where the uh, distance, the vibration is maximized. So none of these are the ultimate solution. Whereas what we thought is, can we use the human body coupling just like we did in the communication to transfer power? Because the th idea is that uh, I already mentioned to you that when it comes to body area, the path loss is much less than that of the human body, I mean the RF, when it comes to body area. So we found that actually the body couple can be used for power delivery as well, okay? And this is the a really rough block diagram of what how you can do that. You are transmitting the power through the body and through the human body, you are going to recover the power at the RX sensor node. And is it safe? That's the biggest problem here that you might ask. The answer is yes, it's absolutely safe because as you can see, you only have one electrode in the TX and one electrode in the RX. It's not the galvanic current, you're, uh, there's no explicit closed loop, but rather the return path is formed by the capacitive ground, just like the body coupling communication, capacitive coupling. Okay, so uh, without further ado, let me show you one video, demo video. So here, what we are trying to do is that you have the power transmitter with the power bank, and we want to transfer the power through the body and power up the calculator in the RX side. We remove the battery in the calculator, as soon as you touch, you can see the calculator is powered up and it is functioning as a calculator. Okay, four multiplied by three is 12. And as soon as you detach, the calculator is turned off and we were actually powering up the calculator through the human body. All right, if you're interested in, you can refer to these um, papers that we recently published. And by doing so, you can potentially power up some wearable devices. Um, uh, throughout the human body. So for, for example, you have one smartphone that will be powering up the entire wearables around your body. That will be more, much more convenient. Okay, so let me conclude my talk today. Uh, wearable band is a good solution for proactive healthcare. And in terms of, we need to think about energy efficiency, convenience, safety, and reliability. And it's, it means that we are not only talking about the five layer energy efficiency, but you also have to think about the data link layer, network, and the application. All right. It's not only the five layer transceiver efficiency that we have to deal with. And uh, to achieve the body area network energy efficiently, uh, we can use the capacitive BCC, body coupled communication as a band network, where it can uh, achieve the energy efficiency bitwise in the five layer but you have to deal with environmental changes which can be mitigated by the uh, other techniques such as the hybrid OFDM. This is not the only, only solution, but I'll say one of the solutions. And we also have to think about the network topology and we found that the star topology is better choice around the human body. And for the future directions, you can utilize the human body coupling for power transfer as well. Uh, we call it body coupled power transfer. Okay, so that's end of my talk today. Uh, I'll be happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you.
Okay, Robin, I think your uh, Romain, I think your uh, speaker is off. Oh, I can I cannot hear you. Is it only me that now? Yes, I can hear. Now. Okay, great, thanks. Yep. So many thanks for your talk. It was really interesting. I can say now that I know more about uh, Ban. Uh, it's really <laughs> far from my field of interest uh, of, of my work, in, actually. So it was really interesting. Uh, I think maybe, Antoine, if you have any questions, I do have some questions in the chat, three, in mm -hmm. fact. So if you, if you, Antoine, you want to start uh, before I go to questions. Sure, sure. Thank you very much for, for your talk, Gerald. It was uh, really excellent, as always. <laughs> and um, yeah, yeah, I was really lucky to be able to use my body to transfer power. <laughs> <laughs> it's still really an early stage research. I, I, won't, I would like to have more uh, researchers working on this field. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and it's harmless. That's <laughs> great. <I can> <laughs> Uh, definitely, and um, yeah, I just have a, a quick, quick question on the on the on the chat channel. Um, you're looking into channels uh, below 120 megahertz. Um, is it related to a given standard, or is there a uh, frequency band that is of uh, interest? Okay, that's a really good question. Um, actually, there at the 802.15.6 stipulates if you're communicating with the body area as well as the external body there is a frequency band you would really have to stick to for example around 400 megahertz as well as 25 megahertz and so forth etc but here um, we are utilizing only within the human body where you have more bandwidth to utilize and that's why you can actually use uh, many different frequencies rather than just uh, using that dedicated frequency but the answer is uh, as you saw the bandwidth, uh, bandpass characteristic of the human body, thus using the standard frequency also uh, is a good choice in terms of uh, using the same uh, same uh, method we are using. Okay, and and do you have a, any idea on on the, the propagation out, outside the body uh, using these this, uh, these frequencies? Do you, do you have any yes. questions on on this? Yes, indeed, we, we did also do that. Uh, you are already touching a very advanced topic, which uh, I, I thank you for asking these questions. Um, as we know, as some of you already know, human body itself will be also acting as an antenna. So if you transmit too much power, the human body will be radiating power. You, your goal is to make sure that the communication and the, um, the signal is constrained within the body. But if you shoot too much power, human body will be working as an antenna and it start radiating. And just like the same effect, the interference through the human body, human body is a good antenna that you will capture all the uh, problem, I mean, radio frequencies that is uh, coupling to the human body. Uh, so then you, you really have to carefully think about how to transmit the power and not to overshoot and also make sure that the interference is mitigated by the technologies. Uh, I have shown, the, this is not only my technology that I presented today, but many researchers are, are investing on, on, on this problem. So yes, you, you do have to worry about this, uh, uh, the, they, yeah. I mean, the, the radiation from the human body as well. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so that means like uh, security or privacy is not like, uh, guaranteed by the fact that it's uh, on or in body. Right. Correct. So I would say by using the human body communication or the body couple communication or band, yes, the chance is much less because the TX power is much less compared with the Bluetooth. Right. But you do have to still worry about the security problems if you, especially if your TX power is high end in, in terms of the body area. Yes. But uh, like, like you said, but the fact that you're using the basis itself doesn't guarantee the security. I'm saying that it's much less, uh, the security breach will be much less compared to the RF. Yeah. Okay, very good. Good very point, good. yeah. So a lot of, uh, yeah, a lot of investigations to, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to follow. Okay, Roman, you, you mentioned you have a few questions. Yeah, it's in the private chat of uh, the, back, the backstage. It's uh, the three questions. Uh, are coming from, from Rob, Robin, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. of mine and the PhD student of uh, Antoine also. Yeah. So hi, I had a few questions earlier during the channel characterization. So first, the first question is, what does your 
what does your coupling electrode element look look like and which size and shape is it yeah so that's an excellent question uh, because uh just to give you some disclaimer this talk is typically uh, a two hour to three hour talk but i constrain it to uh, one and a half one hour and ten minutes that's why i skip many parts but let me see if i can show you okay i think i have it here for the electrode I have some supplementary slides that I can go to. <laughs> okay, this is the uh, in-house fabricated planar fashion of a circuit board. So, or in the polymer, you can do the screen printing with a silver paste to um, to use the um, electrode in the dry electrodes. And typically, you're around 20 millimeters or less. So, for the channel characteristics, we use the 3M electrode. Okay, that's very clear. Um, just to standardize the uh, measurement, we use the 3M electrode to better stick to the human body. But for the measurement, we not only use the 3M electrode, but we also use the dry electrode, the polymer electrode, as well as the textile electrode. But to answer um, Robin's question, well, for the channel characterization, we use the 3M electrode. So that's, I think, a fairly clear <laughs> answer I can give it to him. And also, the second question was, uh, sorry, I... Uh, then. Uh, which which size and shape is it? But I think you. Oh yeah, yeah. That the three electrode is already shown here. So shape yeah. is uh, circular. Size uh, the electrolyte is around uh, I'll say 15 millimeters in diameter. Okay, and for the dry electrode, we intentionally made it in various sizes. For example, we measure for the channel characteristic. I mean the um, electrode characterization. We use different various area. From, uh, ranging from two square centimeters to 10 square centimeters. And as a, a control group, we had a 3M electrode for the measurement. For example, you have measured it for the time, uh, time domain, as well as in the frequency domain, watch the uh, impedance changes. So to, to answer his question, uh, the one that we have used typically for dry electrodes lies within around two square centimeters, which you can see that actually the skin electrode impedance is much higher compared to the 3M electrode. But the trend of the impedance is about the same. So it's about uh, linear, linearly decreasing with the frequency. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, I think. Uh, then the second question: uh, Did you perform non-line of sight measurements? Yes. Uh, uh, is he referring to the RF uh, or? Okay, let me go to that slide. Let me see. I think he's referring to. Here, nineteen. He say. Okay. He say. Yeah. I meant BCC non line of sight. Oh yeah, BCC is uh, of course non line of sight because BCC you cannot guarantee line of sight most of time because for this particular example we had um, for example let's give an example of the arm to ear case. Arm to ear case means that you have uh, the transmitter in the ear and the arm. If your ear is this side and the arm to ear with the 120 centimeters, this implies that your transmitter is in this side and the arm is the other end. So there's no line of sight. Right? So then the answer is yes, we have measured for the BCC non line of sight as well as line of sight. So if the lead, uh, ear to arm in the um, 10 centimeter wise, that means there's a line of sight. But it, once it extends to around 150 to 150 centimeters, this is uh, definitely no non-line non of sight case, right? So okay, I hope that answers you. the question, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, and then the last question, uh, for the demo during the conference, could it mean that the capacitive BCC still relies on some RF propagation? Oh yeah, this is also a good point. So let mm -hmm. me also go to that slide. I'm very happy to hear these high quality questions. <laughs> okay, so, uh, okay, let me see. I think this is what we can do. So what I can say is we are still relying on the same mechanism that we have seen in the BCC for communication. So that means the forward propagation is done by the electrical field and the return path is formed by the parasitic ground. So in that term, yes, it is a partially RF, but the frequency band is still around 20 megahertz, around 80 megahertz we are utilizing. And the reason is because the path loss was the least for that, um, that path band. Okay, thank you. I think we don't have 
other questions? No, okay. that's the end. So many thanks uh, okay. for being here today. Uh, I know that uh, Robin just say thank you, Professor, for your answers. Okay, thank you. So thank you for being here today. I know that uh, it would have been better if you would have been in uh, Bordeaux or in Lille uh, for a, a physical talk, but uh, we are really happy to have you today and yeah, to uh, and have uh, students from the Entertainment Mecca and uh, also Lille, I think, uh, to show them uh, what uh, is going in uh, electronics and uh, nowadays. So here today, what what it was more linked to uh, to what connected the objects uh, around the body. So many thanks. Uh, I hope you enjoy uh, your live uh, talk. Yeah, I and really enjoyed to uh, talking as well as uh, answering the questions. Yeah. OK, great. So just before to close the live, I'm just going to make a small recall about the next week uh, talk. Uh, it, we are going to welcome um, Professor Ogor Zalek, and it's going to be on uh, microelectronics going 3D. So for French people, ajouter une dimension à vos circuits. So I hope you will be uh, a lot uh, next week, like uh, this week. So many thanks uh, to all of you for being here today to see the talk. And thank you, Professor. And also, thank you, thank you Antoine, because I know you're on holiday. So many thanks for being here today. <laughs> thank okay. you very much, Roman. Thank you, yeah. Gerald. Yeah, thank nice you very much. Yeah. Bye-bye. Au revoir. <laughs> Bye. Au revoir.